Welcome to the program. I'm Jokia Rogers. We begin in the UK where the magistrate court has accepted that the kidney donor in the case of former Deputy Senate President Ike Kurimadu and his wife Beatrice is not a minor. Prosecution in the case say they have confirmed that, the da that David Upo is 21 years old. This new evidence came to light today when both defendants appeared at the UK magistrate court where they pleaded not guilty to all charges against them. But they are to be remanded in custody till the next adjourned date of August the 4th when the case will be heard at the Central Criminal Court. It was also determined that the case will be heard in the United Kingdom and not transferred to Nigeria. The Federal High Court in Abuja had on Wednesday, July the 6th, ordered the National Identity Management Commission to transmit the certified true copy of the biodata information on David Upo to the Attorney General of the Federation for onward transmission to the United Kingdom. The documents were sought for the purpose of effectively defending the Akurimadus in the UK. Well, our London correspondent Juliana Olainka was at the Westminster Magistrate Court earlier today and now gives an update. Well, given the huge public interest around this case involving the former Deputy Senate President Ike Ekwiramadu and his wife Beatrice, there were no surprises that Westminster Magistrates Court uh, was absolutely full, full of uh, individuals that had specifically flown in from Nigeria to show the Senator some support. And, of course, uh, there are Nigerians within the British community uh, that have a keen interest in the trial, too. Uh, two big um, outcomes from today's hearing. Uh, just uh, when the magistrate uh, was to dismiss the court, uh, the defence lawyers representing the Aquarimadus uh, produced this piece of evidence uh, that had been accepted by the prosecution, which is that this individual is not a minor. It appears as if the information that had been gathered uh, by the senator's uh, defence team in Nigeria had reached uh, London in time for this hearing uh, today and it was accepted but that doesn't mean uh, that this case isn't indeed serious um, due to uh, the huge public interest uh, the magistrate did ask the prosecution to go through the details um, I won't go through them now because of course many of us will be aware of them but this does involve organ harvesting and modern slavery and now the case was adjourned until the fourth of August. Um, this will now be heard at the Central Criminal uh, Court and both defendants were remanded into custody. I think one of the sticking issues uh, from last week's appearance at Uxbridge Magistrates Court was jurisdiction, uh, but that was cleared up pretty quickly. Um, according to the prosecution, um, uh, the Attorney General did not have to consent um, to whether or not this case could proceed in London. And it appears as if that is the case. Uh, so just to confirm, uh, the former Deputy Senate President Ike Ekweramadu and his wife Beatrice have today in London been remanded into custody yet again. And they are due to appear in front of a judge at uh, the Central Criminal Court on the 4th of August. Juliana Olayinka reporting for Channels TV News in London. Thank you, Juliana. Well, also in the UK, uh, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has resigned as head of the Conservative Party. That's the biggest news coming out of the United Kingdom today. He gave a press conference uh, earlier today, about uh, four hours ago, uh, stating that he will resign as the head of the Conservative Party, but he will uh, re remain in place until uh, someone else is uh, uh, elected to uh, take over from him. While some Africans have been reacting to the political crisis in the United Kingdom, comparing Boris Johnson's refusal to step down as Prime Minister with African politics. Uh, the latest chapter in the saga is that Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said that he will step down as leader of the Conservative Party, but he will remain in office until October, as I reported earlier. Zimbabwean journalist Hopewell Chinono tweeted that Mr. Johnson's proposed plan to stay on until October sounds like a tactic of former President Robert Mugabe. Another commenter urging Mr. Johnson to stay on said that he was showing the world that a sit-tight entitlement mentality is not unique 
into any people or region. Another person says that Mr. Johnson showed that trying to cling to office was not just an African issue. Well, here in Nigeria, the Cross River State Government in the South South has visited victims from Nko and Onyedama communal clash and have supported them with medical services. So the people, uh, they're asking big people to live healthy despite the communal dispute between them. The Director General of the Primary Health Care Development Agency, Dr. Janet Apeyong, explained that the state governor, Ben Ayadi, is concerned about the health situation of those displaced. The skirmish between Unkoa and Unyedama communities has left a trail of death, destruction of property worth millions, and an undetermined number of displaced persons. In the aftermath of the violence, state government officials from the Cross River's primary health care development agencies arrived to provide medical services and relief materials to the displaced. We have um, health personnel providing health services to the people, um, ongoing testing, um, consultations, as well as uh, vaccination is currently ongoing. We have all the nutritional supplements, um, uh, the vitamin A's and the warming tablets for the children, then also some uh, supplies for the pregnant women as well to ensure that they can benefit from um, the services available. Prior to this time, the people of Nko and the near Damal communities have lived together peacefully. Our people are traumatized. Our people are camping in other neighboring villages as refugees. A great number of them are killed and we cannot, as we speak, ascertain the number of casualties that we have. The paramount ruler of Yaka local government area, His Royal Majesty Obola Femubana of Ugip expresses gratitude to the government for the show of love demonstrated at this challenging time. He also uses the occasion to appeal to government to ensure proper settlement of the displaced persons. We are very grateful to them that they came to help our people to support them with few items. You know, a lot of people have been stranded, a lot of people are hungry. So coming to our aid at this time, we appreciate it so well. Expectations are high with these two communities that the state government will put in place the necessary infrastructure in place to give residents a sense of safety. Elsewhere, the UN has warned that eight of the 18 regions in Somalia are now at serious risk of sliding into famine by September due to a devastating drought and the war in Ukraine. At least 200 children have died of malnutrition and disease since January. The number of people suffering from food insecurity has increased to 7 million people compared to 4.5 million in May. The warning comes as the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization released new figures showing that nearly 10% of the world's population are affected by hunger. Eastern Africa and the Sahel are the most affected regions on the continent. Yeah, the humani our humanitarian uh, colleagues are telling us that due to the drought, it is believed that there will be famine in eight areas of the country by September. More than 200,000 men, women and children are experiencing catastrophic levels of food insecurity for the first time since 2017 and food security will likely not improve until the middle of next year. Uh, our humanitarian colleagues warn that more than 7 million people are already impacted by the severe drought up from nearly 6 million in May. More than 800,000 have left their homes in search of food, water and pasture. At least 200 children have died of malnutrition and disease since January. An estimated 1.5 million children under the age of five face acute malnutrition. Late last month, our partners launched the Drought Respond and Famine Prevention Plan to provide life-saving assistance and prevent famine in Somalia. The plan calls for nearly $1 billion to reach 6.4 million people through the end of the year. Separately, the Humanitarian Response Plan for Somalia, which calls for $1.46 billion to help 5.5 million people, is only 30% funded as of today. With nearly 4 million people having received assistance since January, we need much more cash and resources to meet the growing needs and avert a famine. 
In the meantime, the number of people affected by hunger globally rose to as many as 828 million in 2021. That's according to a new UN report. The State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World 2022 report issued by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations uh, was released on Wednesday. Speaking to journalists in New York, Maximo Torero, the chief economist at the Food and Agriculture Organization, said that the pandemic has increased existing inequalities, heightening the challenge of eradication of hunger. While the chief economist of the World Food Program, Arif Hussein, says the reasons for this crisis are conflict, climate, the economic shocks and the rising costs. So as much as 828 million people face hunger in 2021, and this means an increase uh, from 2019, so just before COVID-19, of 100 million more people facing hunger. And we are talking of chronic hunger, which is indicator of SDG that we use. The pandemic has increased existing inequalities, uh, heightening the challenge of eradication of hunger. And our projections show that by 2030, we will be in 670 million people still hungry, which will be exactly the same number when we agreed on the SDG 2 in 2015. So beyond hunger, more than 2.3 billion people in the world lack access to adequate food in 2021, and moderate or severe food insecurity uh, remain stable, but severe food insecurity has increased uh, more in the last two years. When we look at the other indicators of uh, nutrition, of global targets of nutrition, we see a small improvement in child stunting, and exclusive breastfeeding, but it's still not at the velocity that is needed to achieve the targets. And we are also moving in the wrong direction on adult obesity and anemia in women. Uh, what's important is what are the reasons behind this? Uh, we all know the compounding effect of what we call the three Cs, conflict, climate, and the economic shocks and the rising costs. Those three drivers are in a worse situation than they were back in 2008 and 2011 at the last uh, food crisis. And we've had this double succession of, of global crisis, of course, the global pandemic and, and, and the war in Ukraine. The war in the as many lives as possible now, which is basically expanding the food, cash, and nutrition assistance in emergencies. That's the first thing, address acute uh, food insecurity. The second thing is ensuring that people have access to healthy diets. This is addressing the, the cost and income crisis, different ways to do that, expanding social safety net programs, feeding programs. And the third thing, of course, is investing in resilience programming and making sure that people in communities can withhold and recover from the multiple shocks that are, that are hitting them. Thanks. On behalf of the UN Elsewhere, the presidents of the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda have held talks at a time of increased tension over violence in eastern DR Congo. DR Congo's President Felix Shisekedi said after the meeting in Angola that he and his Rwandan counterpart Paul Kagame had agreed to restore trust and de-escalate tension. Angola has been mediating the talks and he announced a ceasefire without giving any details. There have been diplomatic tensions between the two neighbours with DR Congo accusing Rwanda of backing the Tutsi militia known as the M23. Kigali denies this. Earlier, Mr. Shisekedi said that he and he and Mr. Kagame had agreed to normalize diplomatic relations, which have been extremely tense in recent weeks. M23 rebels say talks between Rwandan President Paul Kagame and his Democratic Republic of Congo counterpart Felix Shisekedi will not stop the fighting in the eastern parts of the country. Although the leaders have called for an immediate cessation of hostilities and immediate withdrawal and without condition, an M23 spokesperson, Major William Goma, says that the group will not withdraw from its positions. He said this was a Congolese political problem to be solved among Congolese people. DR Congo accuses Rwanda of backing the M23, which both Kigali and rebels have consistently denied. Mozambican President Filipe Nyusi and his Ukrainian counterpart Volodymyr Zelensky have held a phone conversation to discuss the situation in Ukraine. In a tweet by Mr. Zelensky, the two leaders discussed the situation regarding the war as well as the impact it's having on food security. On his part, the Mozambican president said, 
why his country abstained from voting on a UN re resolution that condemned Russia's invasion of its neighbor. Mr. Nyusi said the dispute should be resolved through dialogue and welcomed Mr. Zelensky's intention to speak to African countries. The conflict in Ukraine has worsened already, existing grain shortages in Africa caused by bad harvests and insecurity. Over 40% of wheat consumed in Africa usually comes from Russia and Ukraine. The Ukrainian leader also congratulated Mozambique on its election as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. And from this Wednesday, fuel prices are up once again in South Africa, just as the country grapples with unending power cuts this winter. The ripple effect on lives and livelihood is stifling, says some of those we have spoken to so far. Our correspondent Betty Devia reports. As power blackouts continue in South Africa, motorists are now bracing themselves for yet another petrol price hike. They will be paying 26 rand 20 per litre the highest petrol price increase South Africa has experienced so far. Business owners bear the brunt of these increases as many who use generators will be spending more while others lose customers. But I don't think we're exclusive on the petrol price. I think the whole world is fighting over the price. They're uh, protesting around the world. Greece is up to 44 rand a litre, so we're not there yet. But uh, yeah, the stupid war in Ukraine, that's the problem with it. The more importantly is Eskom. Mm. Let's talk about Eskom. I just think now with Eskom, you know, everything, our generators are breaking down even now with the amount of hours. It's totally ridiculous. Look, uh, the, the power is chasing my customers away. So I think this is what's happening at the moment is so ridiculous. It's very bad because... Um, like at the moment we, we've got load shedding from 8 to 10 and then 4 to 6 and they and they ra doing this load shedding while we're in, in business hours twice a day, you know. It's very detrimental because people don't come out when there's load shedding. It affects all the signal in the area, so it's very hard. Uh, it's very disappointing actually. It makes cost of living really ridiculous at this point. About a week ago, the country experienced stage six power blackout for the first time ever. And public enterprise minister Pravin Gordon and blame this on striking workers and that the demand on the power utility during winter is much higher. The reason we have level six uh, for the first time in Eskom's history and this country's history is because of the illegal industrial action that has been in place since the 22nd of June. So what level six means is that 6,000 megawatts cannot be supplied by Eskom and uh, where during winter, for example, today or yesterday, the demand is about 32,000 megawatts, Eskom will not be able to supply that 32,000. It will be able to supply 6,000 less than 32,000. And it doesn't mean that the whole country gets into a blackout. The striking workers have now accepted a 7% wage hike offer. Hopefully this will let there be a bit more light going forward. And this Wednesday the country will again face additional prices at the pumps. Motorists say this is a disaster. It's a disaster. It's, it's, a, huge, it's a huge problem. Uh, because now you're going to have companies that are not going to have people coming into work. Because why? Because they can't afford to. Not because they don't want to be there. So I think, it's a, I think it's a big problem. I mean, <laughs> I laugh because there's really nothing else you can do. You get upset, no one's going to listen and no one's going to hear you and no one really cares. The silence from government is deafening, deafening. Like at least somebody needs to say something. While some think solar power could be part of the solutions government is seeking, along with recently approved renewable energy projects, rolling rotational power blackouts continue, and to add salt to injury, electricity tariffs have gone up by 7.47% this July. The family lawyers of Burkina Faso's independence hero, Thomas Nkara, have called on the judiciary to arrest former president, Blaise Kampare, who is expected to return home from exile on Friday. Mr. Kampare, in exile since his ouster in 2014, was in April handed down a life sentence over the 1987 assassination of Sankara. 
The demand by Sankara's lawyers came after the Burkina Bay government announced that Mr. Kampare will be among the former heads of state holding talks with the military junta on Friday as part of efforts to accelerate the question of reconciliation. It's unclear whether Mr. Kampare will be subjected to a judicial process. However, the government said that the upcoming meetings between the junta and ex-leaders does not hinder the legal proceedings initiated against some of them. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed is expected to address the country's parliament as pressure mounts on his government over the killing of hundreds of ethnic minorities in two separate attacks in recent weeks. The violence last month in farming villages in Oromia uh, claimed more than 300 lives and many were killed in yet another attack two weeks later. This will be Mr. Abiy's second appearance before lawmakers in less than a month. While authorities have been quick in blaming a rebel group for the attacks in Urumia, public anger has been directed towards the government with some accusing officials of complicity. Protests were held in multiple places in recent weeks, but conflicts in other parts of Ethiopia indicate the country is still struggling with violence. Elsewhere now, an initiative called Everyday Nile brings together photographers, journalists and researchers from different Nile Basin countries to tell their stories of their communities with the Nile. Take a look. Twisting and curving through 11 countries, the Nile River holds a certain significance for each community it touches. For some, it's a practical source of water for crops. For others, a relaxing escape from the day's hustle and bustle. The Everyday Now exhibit held in Cairo aims to give African journalists an opportunity to showcase what the river means to them and their communities. More than 10 reporters and photojournalists worked for three years documenting and telling the stories of those living on the banks of the Nile. The stories of my family are always connected to being close to the Nile. Here in Cairo, we're deprived from the Nile. We always see the Nile from a distance, and we have no direct relation with the Nile other than drinking from it. But my family there in Upper Egypt could view the Nile and be close to it to move around it. For them, this was their trip and their leisure. The project, which includes stories from Egypt, Sudan, Kenya and Ethiopia, also offer key information and figures about the Nile. It enabled us to have a voice for the Nile, uh, to be able to, uh, to tell its stories that need to be taken into consideration and, and be used in, uh, in making decisions. And the project made broke the boundaries that we have, geographical boundaries, because uh, all of us are coming from different countries, which are they have different jurisdictions and different parts of the line. But when we did the night story, we were all members of the line. This initiative comes at a time of tension surrounding the Nile water shared among Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia over the operation of Ethiopia's Grand Renaissance Dam. It also coincides with rising debate over climate change and pollution challenges surrounding the Nile. For everyday now, artistic director Roger Anis, the challenging times means bigger responsibility to raise awareness of personal responsibility and community sharing towards common risks. That's Network Africa. Thank you for watching. I'm Jocker Rogers.